Um, so I look at uh, welfare reform processes in the Russian Federation um, in the contemporary period, so under Putin. Um, and more specifically, I look at how uh, social services are being outsourced to non-state actors. So that could be NGOs or it could be uh, businesses, for example. Um, I think there are a lot uh, in the context of Russia, um, but probably one of the most pressing would be um, the pressure on household income that we've seen in the last couple of years um, in the light of the financial crisis that started in 2014. Um, so people generally have less money coming in. Um, I would say also the quality of social services tends to be, uh, the provision is quite broad, but the quality can be quite low. Um, so that's also something that uh, people are very aware of, I would say. One thing that is quite striking is that social issues have the capacity to bring people within the sort of local community together. Um, and that could be lobbying for kind of better facilities or for better medical treatment for, for example, children with disabilities. Uh, so that's been quite an interesting development. That's something that's uh, still relatively new in Russia, uh, but that people would try to improve their kind of immediate surroundings and living conditions um, in collaboration with their you know, neighbours and others in the community. Uh, I've been recently working on researching the access to social protection for people working on non-standard employment contracts and for self-employed. Uh, which means uh, analyzing to what extent social protection system in Macedonia is accessible to people like um, those on temporary work, those with uh, on s that are self-employed, or all the others uh, not defined as employed. Yes, well, two aspects I would have to mention in relation to social risk. I would say low incomes and inconsistent incomes, which lead towards material deprivation among households. That would be on the level of social risk. But on, uh, in relation to policy, I would say it's uh, pressing that we have to uh, transform this comp compartmentalized uh, sectoral social policy into an integrated and effective social policy instrument. I would say all those that have represented a form of a bridge between the, those that experience some kind of a risk, risk in terms of accessing social rights and that have contributed towards improvement of that. For example, uh, something that comes to my mind immediately are these uh, Roma health mediators, also programs that uh, have been instituted to support um, informal educational uh, facilities for Roma children. So small scale, but very effective. I have um, two major projects that I am working right now. Uh, one of the projects is focusing on pension reforms. The other is focused on labor policies and the labor politics. So pretty much about the way how state society and business um, interact in the post-Soviet context. I think one of the biggest problems um, and the challenges that these countries are facing are related to um, inequality and gender issues. And based on the research that I was conducting about p on pension systems, I've realized how, how those issues often neglected. So we are thinking about the progressive and kind of you know, fixing and reforming the system, but we're not often looking at how complex the problem is, especially when you're trying to fix and try to reach, for example, gender equity. So that's a really fundamental thing that has to be looked at in a really more comprehensive way. Um, the other is, of course, inequality and the lack of accessibility for certain services for the poor in the rural areas and so on. So those are the two biggest ones, I would say. I think one of the positive developments that I've noticed is um, that there is a growing civil society. So civil society, that's not just, uh, you know, civil society can be defined in different ways. I'm talking about the so-called spontaneous um, movements or actions of people who are organizing, who are helping themselves. And so I've encountered various and numerous ways of how this is, has been done in the past, um, starting from gender groups, uh, helping victims of human trafficking, um, for example, organizing their own shelters for migrants or for the 
for people who were freed from slavery, from sexual exploitation, and so on. The other very promising example is, for example, the understanding of, um, of that children issues and orphanages are really important and so we have to deal with, with those types of problems uh, not just kind of leaving them to the state to tackle but um, realizing that this is the future those are your kids and you have to take care of them um, no matter whether they are your own sons and daughters or not well my focus is on poverty in russia and uh, about social policy as well, what kind of measures are taken to, to deal with this problem. And of course, I'm also looking into the inequality question, but it's very important to distinguish between poverty and inequality. They are not the same thing, and they are also having different kinds of, of development. Well, I would say that it is both these questions about poverty and inequality. As I said, they are two separate problems, but they need to be addressed in some way. And I think the poverty issue is very important because however you measure poverty, there is a huge amount of people very near the poverty lines. And what I find is very important to emphasize is that a lot of people do really work a lot maybe they have extra jobs and this doesn't really help the situation because they get less time to so to say find strategies for more long-term changes i think uh, the the authorities have addressed the problems of low wages in the budget sector i mean in the in the state finance sector uh, they have raised wages for uh, teachers, doctors, social workers, cultural workers, and so on. It's not very much, but I mean, they, they have taken these measures, and I think this is one reason why inequality has in decreased a little during the last couple of years. I'm really oppressed by a lot of work of women in Russia. And I think this should be recognized because they do this with little resources. Well, I'm working on the impact of interaction between the development partners or donor agencies and the recipient countries on the sustainability of healthcare programs. And I'm looking in particular at two countries. One is Kyrgyzstan and the second is Armenia. Well, <laughs> since I'm working on healthcare, I guess I can uh, talk more about it. Yes, the access to healthcare is one of the pressing issues, not just in t these two countries, but also uh, in the post-Soviet region in general, because we came from the system where it was the universal access to healthcare, and the majority of countries retained this access, but unfortunately just on paper. So the issue now is just to ensure the access in practice. And since I'm working on development aids, it's also to um, mainstream or use the resources that we have uh, effectively and to ensure their sustainability in the long run. Well, Kyrgyzstan per se is considered to be is one of the successful cases because they introduced a sector-led approach. According to which the three major donors, they provide direct budget support to the government and the Ministry of Health allocates the money. So this is one of the initiatives if, as they increase the capacity as well as the initiative and ownership of the country. I think it's a really good initiative. Of course, it would be better if you had many donors doing that, but that's a good start. Um, currently, I am focused on social policy development in the free Baltic states. So I compare family policies, also social security uh, structures of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and see uh, whether uh, any um, important structural shifts were implemented during crisis uh, and post-crisis period. And currently, I think very uh, pressing issue is emigration outward labor migration um, from Lithuania and Latvia about like 13 15 percent of population migrated since 1990s and governments are really need to somehow address this issue um, and social policy here comes first because we need to improve uh, unemployment insurance a lot of people who are unemployed we just go uh, away looking for a better a wage and uh, better working conditions. Also, we have to address um, um, uh, family, children poverty, 
and family policy issues uh, because research shows that if um, social policy spends more on family and children, also on unemployment and social assistance, poverty and equality is lower in the societies. Uh, Baltic states um, have um, uh, a lot of working women and uh, our family policies, especially for children, uh, for, for um, children up to one or two years, they are very similar to Scandinavian family policies. So we have pa parental leave, quite generous parental leave implemented in three Baltic states and in Estonia. Uh, parental leave is more generous in Europe, so this is uh, some kind of success story. Um, and we have also we have um, paternity leave, so this is also very much uh, common for Scandinavian countries. That means that um, gender equality is increasing in every Baltic states. Uh, also, the, when the uh, FIENA joined European Union, uh, issues of um, disabled people. Uh, gay rights were addressed, so that means that uh, human issues um, are now in much better conditions if we compare to, for instance, Soviet time. I'm a sociologist and I'm currently working on Russian welfare policy, so social policy in contemporary Russia, in particular family policies, and I have an international research project on child welfare reform in contemporary Russia that is an ongoing deinstitutionalization process of, of, of child welfare and protection structures. I think if you ask from the Russian government, they would say that it's this severe decline in the population, so this so-called demographic crisis. But I would say that it's more on different kinds of inequalities that are intersectional, so, so that is in terms of income, poverty, also regional inequality, big difference between cities and, and especially countryside and more peripheral areas. If you think about social problems generally, of course, much positive has happened until the, the collapse of the socialist system, which, which was kind of an explosion of, of many kind of social, social problems. So many issues have, have been made visible in the society, for instance. I think that domestic violence, disabled rights and, and, and things like that, that the Russian NGOs have been very active in kind of uh, publicizing many, many of those issues. If I now look at the child welfare policy, lots of good things are happening also there. So currently I look at uh, labor market, uh, particularly active labor market policies and the impact on poverty reduction in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Well, I think uh, still the most important social challenge is poverty and uh, growing inequality. And what I have uh, examined and what I have found in my research is that there is a shift from social assistance to active labor market policies within the social protection system, which uh, embodies the shift in the relationship between the state and society, where families and individuals are taking more responsibility and there is a change in relationship in terms of more self-reliance and less, I would say, reliance on the, on the state. There are some programs that specifically aimed at promoting productive employment in several countries in this region that I'm looking at. And what I have found is that there are some programs that have indeed contributed to better living standards, they created jobs. So I think that could be seen as a success story. But what I have also found that it's not just about the, the, the uh, number of jobs, it's about the quality, it's about the level of payment and also about expanding opportunities, including for women and for working mothers in particular. Um, what I'd like to do is to look at what we have already written about with co-authors, this peculiar 
retrenchment process that I think we are seeing across post-socialist welfare states. Um, poverty and particularly child poverty. And I think the problem with child poverty is that it's really the tip of the iceberg. Um, so if we delve into, if we use child poverty as a starting point, then I think we can go further to see why is it uh, that children are the most exposed group to poverty uh, in both of these countries. And one of the things that was introduced in the mid-2000s were so-called um, um, health mediators and educational mediators. And these are trained um, non-professional individuals in the local community. And uh, what they do is they act as advocates for individual families and individual children uh, to access education, normal services, especially preschool and, and elementary school education, and to, uh, primary and secondary healthcare services.